to let you know, um, I spoke to my little atheist, will we get started in just a few minutes? And just to cue our first speaker, our first speaker after the chair slides is going to be for you know, segment routing BHP egress pure engineering, uh, Meng Zhao possibly. So Sasha is telling us that uh, the mic is close, uh, is quiet, so we have to speak very directly. Okay. Uh, and I'll need the clicker. Do you want me to stand up there to do it? I don't mind standing. Good afternoon. We have a tight agenda. So we'll take the least important part first, which is the chair slides. Uh, there is a note well here. If you're the first time people, raise your hand, you need to read this, make sure you understand it. If you're a long timer, maybe like uh, several of us here, you should still make sure there's nothing you have new in the note well. Other than that, I won't read to you. Um, make sure uh, you sign into a Meet Echo. We don't like being in small rooms, so please do that. Uh, use the Meet Echo to join the queue. We will take the queue from that. Notice Meet Echo is, uh, if you're using the full client, changed. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we have a full agenda packed. We also have Friday, uh, so it's packed. Please uh, be at attentive to your time. And I will be attentive to the chair's time to begin with. So that's Friday's agenda. And it looks like we need to pull the second slide up. So I'm going to give you a brief status. As um, if you're on the IDR list, you will find the status there. You will find it on the wiki. Yep, there we go. So there are a few drafts. Uh, and by the way, thanks to G, G, wave your hand, our uh, IDR secretary who puts all the slides up. Anybody who presents knows how helpful he is. Okay. In Auth 48, we have SRV6 in Auth 48. I have dates it started. Please respond to it. And as well, we have uh, draft IDR long live graceful restart. That's really good. We have uh, RFC uh, 7752 BIS, BGPLS BIS. It has had its hold removed, so it's back being edited. So the author should watch for that. There is a, uh, a draft in the ADQ, uh, which is an info draft. It's been there about 49 days. On the IDR Wiki, you will find how long your draft's been in there. We have had two drafts returned from the AD to the working group. That is the RPD draft and the wide communities draft. The wide communities draft was returned for editorial issues and the RPD draft was returned because it depends on the wide community draft. The shepherd's queue. We have uh, SDN edge discovery, uh, cares handling that and um, 
he, I still has to review 12. I'm one of the authors, so I'm working with him. Uh, the segment, uh, the draft IDR segment routing TE policy 26, I've run into uh, a bit of a data tracker issue I need to talk with Andrew about. Flag, Andrew. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, we'll, I'll figure out what to do, but that's about ready to go, minus I need to do a NITS review. I have to review for all the editorial English. We have two drafts. We have a draft awaiting implementation. The entropy draft passed working group last call, but it doesn't have two implementations, if you know of one. We have CAR and CT going toward experimental. Although we've had things about where we're going from there, we're focused on getting these two drafts to experimental. If you have comments, comment now so that we have less when we get to working group last call. Of course, we will take comments in working group last call. Okay, adoption call. We had four drafts running simultaneously in our adoption call plus draft G, uh, IDR, MP, BGP, Extend, Format 6 that went through with a lot of interest, but, I, uh, we're, but there are some editorial issues and some questions. Now, that takes a step back. As chairs, we're trying to front load the process. You're starting to see shepherd reviews for individual drafts. You're trying, starting to see us try to help when it's adopted or when it looks like it's ready to be adopted to go through a lot of discussions. Our hope is if we catch editorial issues and technical issues early, we're not gonna have as many delays. Uh, and so on Friday, after I've talked through the uh, drafts that were in adoption, we'll announce the uh, results of those. These are the upcoming uh, adoptions. Um, Hopefully you can read that. There's presentations there. If you're on hold here in this list, please see me so we can work on that. And I'm uh, managing the queue of adoptions for my uh, uh, jury right now. So if you are requesting adoption here, so I do not miss it, please send me or the IDR chairs uh, a note to make sure I did not miss your adoption call. We will catch it in the minutes. Hopefully we'll catch it in the recording but one more message won't hurt you. Thank you, we'll go on to the next. Hello everyone, uh, this is Meng Xiao Chen from UHCC Technologies. On behalf of my co-authors, I will give this presentation about segment routing BGP EPE over layer two bundle. It is the first time this draft is presented in the working group. Next slide, please. Uh, there are deployments where BGP session is established on L2 bundle. Uh, in the example network, uh, the operator of AS1 wishes to apply a BGP EP policy to steal the time sensitive traffic from AS1 to AS2 by a member link one of the layer two bundle, since member link one has the lowest delay. Uh, to meet such requirement, BGP pairing seeds need to be allocated to individual bundle member links, and the advertisement of such BGP pairing seeds in BGPLS is also required. Next slide, please. Uh, RFC 9085 uh, specified that IGP adjacency seed can be carried on the say, L2 bundle member attributes TRV in BGPLS, but how to carry BGP EP seed on the L2 bundle is not included. RFC 9086 defines three types of EP seed, but none of them is suitable for L2 bundle member link. Therefore, we need to define the behavior of peer adjacency segment for L2 bundle member link, along with the corresponding TRV in BGPRS. Next slide, please. The semantics of peer adjacency segment for L2 bundle member link is defined as 
forwarding across the bundle member link, which the segment is associated with, to the peer connected through the parent L3 interface. The BGP LS advertisement of peer adjacency segment for L2 bundle member link is also defined. A BGP LS link NLRI is used to describe the parent L3 link. Uh, the peer adjacency seed for member link are carried in the L2 uh, bundle member attribute TLV. Mm. On MPRS SR data plane, a uh, new L2 bundle member peer adjacency seed TLV is defined in this draft to carry the label for member link. On SRV6 data plane, the SRV6 and X seed TLV can be used to carry the SRV6 seed for member link, which is already specified in existing draft. Next slide, please. This is a format of new defined L2 bundle member a peer adjacency seed TLV. It can carry a label or an index of the EPE seed associated with the member link. Uh, that's all. Uh, any questions or comments are welcome. We do not have any questions in the room. Oh, thank you. Thank you for presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Li Zhang from Huawei. I will introduce a BGP SR policy extension for part scheduling. Okay. okay, okay. This page shows the background. Uh, we have two use cases. The first case is the uh, tidal network. As we all know, uh, the traffic on the network are not uh, not always smoothing, so it has uh, peak points and value points as shown in the figure. But the network devices are always running, uh, so when the traffic is at a low level, the uh, network energy efficiency is very low. So an uh, effective way to, de uh, to deal with this problem is to shut down or disable some links or nodes to reduce the energy consumption. Uh, but this, uh, this brings another problem is that the topology of the network changes very frequent, which, uh, which may lead to uh, package loss and uh, uh, maybe not uh, forwarded correctly. And another case is a resource utilization efficiency case. Uh, you know, uh, as our policy, when the controller uh, calculates a pass, it would need to reserve some resources for the pass. But uh, uh, sometimes the traffic just uh, lasts for a short time. And there is, uh, so, so the resource may be wasted for a long time. So uh, in order to reduce the packet loss and improve the energy utilization efficiency, uh, the scheduling, pass time, uh, scheduling time information need to be added for the pass to enable the uh, to switch the passes uh, based on time. Okay, uh, this page shows what I, we have done for SR policy. Uh, we do, uh, we add the scheduling time information to the BGP SR policy, and we have two uh, intention methods. The first one is we can add the scheduling time information for each candidate pass. Uh, this means the uh, every pass uh, described by the segment list uh, both have the same scheduling time, and the second way is uh, we add uh, scheduling time information for each pass. This is uh, uh, maybe more precise uh, for the pass. Uh, but considering that uh, the uh, segment list in the candidate pass always uh, used uh, for uh, load balancing, so maybe master one is more reasonable. Okay, this, this page shows how to use the scheduling time information in the SR policy. Uh, 
uh, firstly, the controller need to calculate uh, parts of the uh, schedule time information and deliver it to the hard end. And uh, secondly, when the hard end receives this uh, uh, policy, it need to store and store the schedule time information. And when our uh, package arrives, the hard node will steer this package into a specific uh, policy. Uh, but within a uh, policy, it also need to determine uh, which parts uh, to forward the packet. Uh, we have two ways to determine the uh, final forwarding path. The, the first way is to uh, determine, uh, dynamically de determine the path whenever a packet uh, arrives. And the second way is uh, we can set a timer for each valid path. And uh, whenever the timer is uh, time out, we just have to switch the parties. Okay, the, uh, this page shows the sharing time information formats. Uh, we also have two uh, different two formats uh, for the sharing time information for pe uh, periodic and uh, uh, aperiodic scenarios based on the traffic uh, uh, and uh, topology chain regularity. And uh, the only difference between these two formats is that the periodic uh, uh, shutdown time information have a periodic uh, field. Uh, okay, that's all. Any comments or uh, opinions are welcome. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, Drew in the queue. And then putting myself in the queue. Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned, I think in the document, you do reference the PC RFCs, which did this for RSVPT. And, uh, and there is, of course, a TEAS document, which talks about scheduled resources as well, yeah. focusing on RSVPT. Now we are sort of applying that for SR policy as well. The question was that for encoding, you deviated a little bit uh, and tried to come up with a new encoding for start time and how we are doing. There was a use case also there about scheduling multiple LSP at a particular interval. Those things are not handled here. I was hoping that whatever we do, we can, can have a consistency between the protocol as well as the use cases. What we do for RSVPT, it's better if we do it for SR policy rather than coming up with something new. So that's just suggestions to maintain some consistency between the use cases and the protocol. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that is a phone call from Zhongguo Jin Laboratory. I have a simple and uh, basic uh, question about, normally the SR policy is deployed with a controller for yeah. the past calculation. And uh, so my question is about it's in your draft, you provide a new option on the data plane to resolve this issue, or is there any special or dedicated user case? you have just the one choice to resolve it to the data plane solution. Uh, sorry, we, we, we haven't defined a data plane solution, yeah, not, not just a, a, as a policy. Yeah. But, yeah. So, um, so, but normally it could be triggered by the control plane, the controller. Yeah. And uh, it, if it uh, on time, it, it triggered uh, the switch, pass switch and uh, maybe yeah. no data uh, assist of the... Yeah, okay, we yeah. can continue this class on the mailing okay. list. Okay. Ketan? Okay. Okay. Uh, Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, I think I had a similar thing. Do we need a protocol encoding here? Why couldn't the controller do the scheduling? Uh, so sorry, I didn't get it. <laughs> uh, I mean, do we need this in the, add this in the protocol? Uh, yeah. The controller itself could run a scheduler and, you know, download the path when it's time or take it out when it is not time. Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah. So Ketan's question is, this is a dynamic protocol. So why could not the protocol simply advertise, you know, when it needs to have this done? Um, I can help to answer this uh, Katan's uh, comment. Uh, actually, we think that uh, this is uh, for the tidal network use case, which is uh, the changes are predictable so that we can pre-configure or pre-provision this uh, as a policy with this uh, scheduling information to the uh, ingress node be, instead of using the controller to do it uh, uh, on demand. This can be more precise for some kind of use cases. 
just a quick thing so then we would probably need to wait and see what comes from the tvr architecture right okay yeah 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 yes this can coordinate with the tvr uh, requirements and uh, actually i think uh, lee is also a contributor to that document and myself is uh, second to last, it looks like. Um, in your protocol, you have a time as a 32-bit value. Is this a Unix time T? Uh, so, sorry. Your 32-bit time value in the protocol, what goes yeah. in that field? What is, like? what is, what is the 32-bit time? 32 time? Yes, time is enable time, disable time, yeah. Those are 32 bits. What goes in there? <laughs> what, what, what is that value used for? Yeah, uh, this, is, okay. this, this is used for, for the uh, head node to, to know which or when the part is valid or when the part is not valid. Okay. okay. So I, I will send my comment to the mail list, but uh, uh, normally when it is 32 bits, it is a Unix time value. Yeah. which will stop working in 2038. <laughs> and you probably do not want that to happen. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Andrew? Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask um, if you had taken this draft to TVR or made them aware of it, um, just because it could potentially impact work that is going on in there. And if not, I would ask that you also please make sure that TVR is aware of this work so that they can potentially weigh in on some of it as well, because it could have some impact there. Yeah, the, uh, I think the TVR is mainly focused on the requirements and the use cases. Yeah, and uh, the, this technology work is also the use cases of TVR. But TVR don't uh, cover the uh, protocol intention, so we, we do this work in uh, IDR. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ethan Liu from China Mobile. Uh, <clears throat> today, I will introduce the BGP extension for the uh, distributing candidate path threshold constraints of the SR policy. Uh, firstly, uh, I will introduce the background. And uh, last ITF, uh, we have proposed a, a draft about the a flexible uh, path selection mechanism. Uh, we have a uh, uh, present at the uh, last, last ITF in the spring uh, working group. And uh, uh, for the uh, standard RFC uh, 9256, uh, uh, we, we, we know that uh, <clears throat> as long as there is a, a valid uh, seg segment list in the candidate path, and the candidate path is valid, and uh, it will not. Uh, switch uh, to the uh, backup candidate path. So, uh, but uh, in, some, uh, in some scenario, uh, the remaining segment lists uh, in the active uh, candidate path uh, may not meet the uh, requirements. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the FIG, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for the candidate path uh, CP1 and CP2, we all, all, both have uh, three segment lists. And the requirement is that the bandwidth, uh, we must be on the 200 megabits. But uh, when the segment list uh, one and two become invalid. Uh, so even if the candidate pass two, the CP2, uh, can meet the uh, requirements of the bandwidth, but uh, uh, the traffic will continue on, uh, forwarding on the, on the CP1. So uh, to address this uh, issue, we propose a, a flexible uh, path section mechanism. So uh, this proposal in the IDR uh, working group, we uh, define uh, the extension of BTP to a distribute forwarding quality threshold and metric constraints parameters uh, of the candidate paths. Okay. Uh, in the uh, 
as a policy structure uh, for the for the uh, for the BGP, uh, we will uh, add the uh, two new <coughs> sub tier V's in the uh, candidate pass level. Uh, the first one is the uh, bandwise constrained sub tier V. Uh, the second one is the SR metric constrained sub tier V. Uh, and the second one we referenced to the uh, BPRS SR policy uh, draft. Uh, this is the encoding of the uh, first, uh, first one uh, sub tier V. Uh, we defined the uh, uh, bandwise uh, threshold constraint parameters. Uh, this is the second mat metric constraint sub tier V. Uh, it may, it may uh, use for the latency or the metric, etc. And uh, uh, we reference the for, uh, to the to the BDPRS as our policy draft, and we will uh, extend in the future. Um, that's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome for the questions and the comments. Are there any questions online? It doesn't look like it. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Krzysztof Czakowicz. I'm from Juniper Networks. I'm here on behalf of my co-authors uh, Israel Mains from at and and Moshiko from Juniper Networks as well to discuss the uh, interconnecting of uh, domains using IBGP. So not eBGP as usual, but IBGP. Uh, so first of all, uh, motivation. So why, why do we discuss it at all? So we know that uh, there are many, many use cases that service providers or operators in general, or not only operators, not only service providers uh, over networks as well, needs to be divided into smaller pieces, the smaller domains. There could be different reasons for that. So one is some, you know, some regionalization, say of north, north uh, part of the network, south, east, west, whatever, and they're in different, different domains. Uh, second could be s some administrative separation. So different uh, operating teams uh, are operating the network. For example, I could have, you know, one team operating access aggregation network, another team operating the core network, and, and they're in different domains for the, from, from the administrative uh, perspective. Uh, then there could be, you know, size, scaling of the networks, the network becomes too big, so we need to divide into smaller pieces and so on. There could be probably some more use cases for that. Uh, so I think that's clear that we need, to, there are some use cases that we need to divide the network. Then the second, is how we interconnect the networks. So, of course, external BGP, eBGP was designed to interconnect such domains, but there are many use cases that it is not very, you know, easy for the operator to introduce this one. Uh, for example, in the brownfield deployments, the network is growing. We need to divide the network into smaller pieces. And then, of course, there could be problem of the renumbering of the ASs if, if you start to use new ASs, acquiring new AS numbers, and so on and so on. So that's the reason we see uh, in deployments as well today that many operators are using uh, IBGP to interconnect the domains. Uh, and this draft, uh, so we're not trying to argue against EBGP versus IBGP to, internet, uh, to interconnect uh, the domains, you know, to list advantages, disadvantages. We are trying to acknowledge that IBGP could be used and we are trying to describe what are the challenges, uh, you know, uh, how should you do that, uh, best, the best common practices and so on for, for IBGP. And uh, we are looking here for three, basically three main, at the high level, three main options. So option A is to, you know, VLAN handoff between the domains. So there's no, no as such BGP could be inside of each uh, service. VLAN could be some uh, BGP, but not, not, not uh, a global BGP. And then, of course, we have option B. So option B is basically exchanging the um, information service prefixes between the domains with the next hop change on the 
on the domain wonder is we introduced as well the, the DBR uh, nomenclature is domain wonder because this is not different AS, so it's not ASBR, it's DBR. Could be two options here. So one option is uh, disaggregated DBR or could be consolidated collapse uh, DBR between the, the two domains. And option C, when we exchange the transport information uh, with one uh, BGP, uh, with changing the next for the transfer information, this is SAFI 4 in the example here, and as well the service information without then changing the next and doing the uh, resolution, uh, recursive resolution on the APs. And again, could be collapse uh, DBR as well, design. So we are discussing in the draft, you know, some options regarding security, loop preventions, uh, and so on and so on. And of course, we are open for any questions and, and comments here. So we are thankful for, we received for this some for revision two comments from Robert and Bruno. We are, thank you, we'll be working on the next revision to address these comments and seeking feedback from the working group as well. Thank you. Hey, Kevur Patel, I have one comment as a working group chair and one comment as a working group member. With my chair hat on, um, I think what you're trying to do um, is uh, move option ABC to IBGP. Sadly, the option ABC was standardized in layer three VPNs, which is now a best working group. So you should go and present there minimally. I see the best chair at least sitting there. So please do go present there. Okay. Um, with working group chair hat off as a working group member. Um, there is also an RFC inside best working group which is IBGP PEC that allows you the stacking of an attributes, which is the next set of problems. So minimally you should have a section here as to talk about uh, why you want to not do PEC and just do stock IBGP or what are the pros and cons? Understood. Okay. Thank you. Uh, David Lampotter, a very simple comment. Um, can you please make the title of the draft more specific? Because it's very generic and it's almost giving me a heart attack when I see the title, just of the draft as a whole. All right. So what, what do we have in mind here? It's specific. You're specifically talking about interconnecting VPNs in the oh, draft. Okay, so I see. I see. All right. Okay, it's missing understood. from the title. All right. Okay, I see. You can make it VPN. Yes, yes, yes. I understand. Any final questions online? Thank you very much. Thank you. Your choice for the next. Oh, sorry. This one. Okay, good. There you go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, I'm Zhuo Tao Liu from Tsinghua University. Uh, before that, an assistant professor from Tsinghua University. Before that, I was a uh, technical lead at Google working on data center networking. Uh, this is the first time I attend IETF personally. And uh, uh, it's the uh, first time to give a talk in front of many uh, internet uh, practitioners, and I'm very excited to share my work and hopefully to collect uh, feedback from the community. So today, on behalf of all the co-authors, I would like to present FCBGP, uh, which is a system to uh, improve the uh, security of the interdomain routing. Uh, so let's start with a bit of the problem statement. So we all know that the internet uh, uh, interdomain routing uh, has vulnerabilities in both the control plane and the data plane. So on the control plane, uh, there is no built-in uh, mechanisms that is widely deployed uh, to verify the BGP announcement. This means that the adversary can manipulate uh, the BGP pass to hijack traffic. On the data plane, uh, there is no uh, the actual uh, data forwarding pass might not be consistent uh, with the BGP pass, uh, which might uh, raise security issues. So over the past few decades, uh, both the uh, academia and the industry have worked on um, uh, significant uh, proposals to improve the security of interdomain routing. Uh, this work can be roughly placed into three categories. 
Uh, the first category is the BGP security enhancement, among which are the two popular RFCs, uh, RPK and BGPSEC, uh, which is being standardized by the, by the IETF. Uh, in the forwarding path validation, there are a bunch of academic work, such as the Cyan Internet Architecture, led by Professor Andrew Perrick from, CP, uh, from CMU and ETH. And there are also a bunch of source validation uh, uh, approach like SAVA, uh, which our group at Tsinghua University has worked uh, for many, many years. Uh, but even with all this effort, uh, we are still seeing this, uh, pro uh, these problems of uh, internet security uh, uh, today. This is probably because of the slow adoption of these protocols, either due to the lack of deployment incentives or because it's uh, or because of the practical issues like incompatibility uh, with the current internet architecture. So today I hope to present a, a FCBGP that is trying to improve uh, the security of interdomain routing. Specifically, we have these two design goals in, in mind while we design FCBGP. So on the control plane, uh, in the case of full deployment, where all the ASs are upgraded to support FCBGP, we hope that it can guarantee that any BGP path authenticated by our protocol is a, is a real and legitimate path that announced by all the unpass ASs. In other words, it is infeasible for the adversary to claim a forged BGP path to be validated, to be authenticated. Uh, in the case of partial deployment, where only part of the ASs are aware of this new protocol, we hope that this FCBGP is completely compatible with native BGP. That means the FCBGP speaker and the native BGP speaker, they can communicate without any change of, uh, of the native BGP protocol. And also, we hope the FCBGP is incrementally deployable such that it offers strictly positive security benefits for BGP paths whose on-pass ASs are not fully deployed. So we hope that with this compatibility and incremental deployability, we can, we can incentivize the early adoption of this protocol. And on the data plane, we hope that uh, the ASs were able to enforce uh, security policies on the unwanted traffic, such as the traffic uh, with spoofed, address, uh, spoof, spoofed source addresses and sent via undesired paths. So they can sort of, sort of like either discard this traffic or enforce any low priority on this traffic. So before diving into the protocol, we have, uh, we discussed first some of the problem space and assumptions. Uh, first, we assume that the ASs have an access to an internet scale uh, trust base, such as the RPKI, which stores the authoritative information about the mapping between the AS numbers and IP prefixes. And because FCBGP BGP will involve some uh, cryptography operations, we also assume that uh, they have stored the public keys uh, for those ASs. And second, uh, we consider that the multipass forwarding, either because of the traffic engineering or ECMP, is not a violation of the data, data plane security. That means if the inconsistency between the control plane and data plane is because of this multipass forwarding, we think that is fine. That is not a security issue. And we also consider a very strong adversary that can interpret all the BGP update message in network. So they could collect this BGP update to analysis and behave arbitrarily, like uh, launch path manipulation attacks on a, on, a data, on a control play to hijack a BGP path, or they could basically spoof the source addresses or reroute uh, the traffic to some desired ASs on the data plane. And finally we, uh, finally, we exclude the case where two compromised ASs will, will include. So basically, this is because if uh, these two ASs were, were able to include, they could share their private keys and they could essentially behave as the same entity. So it will be very difficult to deri derive any uh, desirable, uh, meaningful security, prop uh, perspective, uh, security properties, at least from the academic perspective. So the FCBGP is built upon a, a primitive called verifiable routing commitment. So let's suppose that an ASB receives an, uh, receives an BGP update from its peer a, uh, ASA for prefix P. So if the ASB decides to uh, accept this pass and then extend this pass to its, AS, uh, to its neighbor ASC, so it will compute a 
uh, a verifiable routing commitment to publicly certify its routing intent over the next hop to the ASC. The construction of this FC is uh, a straightforward, it's simple. It, it, it is signed uh, by the uh, ASB saying, okay, I receive an update from ASA and I'm waiting to extend this pass to my peer to ASC. And afterwards, uh, the ASB will put this into uh, a, a new pass attribute and then uh, send the entire BGB update to its peer ASC. So at a very high level, uh, FCBGP adopts a per pathlet validation scheme because each AS only certifies its routing intent through on a two hop pathlet. It does not care, it, it does not consider any ASs beyond its neighbors. This is different from, uh, this is different from the per pass validation scheme like BGP sec, which the ASs has to uh, recursively work back to the entire pass to validate the pass. So we, we argue that with this thing, uh, the BG, FC BGP has two benefits. Uh, the first is in case of full deployment, uh, we show that FC BGP achieves the same security guarantee as the BGP SAC, and uh, we, will prove this, we will prove this later, uh, but it will impose much lower verification, uh, much lower overhead for pass validation in a dynamic networks like internet. Because even if the end-to-end -end BGP pass changed, uh, there, the pass rate, some of the pass rate may not be, re, remains the same. That means we will not to revalidate this pass rate. And also in the partial deployment case where only part, part of the ASs are upgraded, we will show that with data-driven analysis, we will show that FCBGP provides more security benefits uh, than BGP sec. So as stated before, FC, FC BGP does not modify the AS pass attribute. Instead, it defines a new transitive pass attribute to carry the FCs. As a result, the legacy ASs, which does not understand FC BGP, can still forward this attribute to its peers without changing, changing uh, any uh, protocol. Therefore, we, we see FC BGP is natively compatible uh, with the BGP. Uh, this is quite different from BGP sec, which replaces uh, the AS pass attribute with a new uh, secure pass attribute. So with, uh, so with FC, uh, the uh, BGP pass validation uh, is uh, as follows. In full deployment, where every, every on-pass AS will generate uh, a forwarding commitment, commitments, and AS will uh, simply check whether uh, there ex exists a FC for, to certify each individual path late on a pass. If that's the case, uh, this pass is considered to be validated. Uh, in the case of a partial deployment, uh, the AS pass might traverse a undeployed zone containing a legacy AS that does not understand uh, the FC BGP. Uh, because we made this uh, pass attribute transitive, uh, these FCs can actually traverse through uh, this undeployed zone to reach ASD. In that case, although the ASD cannot authenticate the full pass, it can still use these FCs to authentic authenticate part of the pathlet. Therefore, if, if there is an a, uh, attacker ASE that tries to claim, okay, I have a direct link to ASA, uh, the ASD will reject this claim because the ASA certify the routing intent to ASB rather than to ASE. And we do also do, do some measurement of this uh, uh, commitment generation uh, using some key, dat, key dat, uh, data set. So we found the busiest AS, which is the AS generated the, most, uh, the highest number of uh, BGB updates. Uh, it needs to generate roughly 130 million uh, forwarding commitments in one month. Uh, we, and we benchmark this generation on our test bed uh, saying, okay, each generation of routing commitment is, takes roughly about 30 milliseconds. So if we do a simple math, uh, it takes roughly 71 minutes to generate all these 138 million FCs. But actually these FCs are generated over a one month period. So the generation overhead seems quite uh, less. And we also do some internet scale evaluation, seeing, okay, uh, even if the BGP pass changed, uh, but over 36% of the two hop pass rate remains the same. That means we do not, re we do not need to revalidate uh, this pass rate, even if the end-to-end -end BGP pass is changed. As a result, uh, the pass rate based the authentication scheme has lower dynamic verification overhead. 
And uh, and the, in this in next segment, I will do I will highlight some security analysis for FCBGP. Uh, so basically, uh, we uh, and we we show that uh, because FCBGP is per pathlet, uh, the adversary may try to strategically combine uh, the FCs collected from different passes so that it can authenticate a forced pass. Uh, we prove that any pass then can can be validated by strategically combining FCs is actually a legitimate pass that is announced by this all by all these on pass ASs. So we, we, uh, for more detailed uh, proof, please uh, read our uh, preprint uh, available on archive. And also in the partial deployment, uh, the key observation is because FCBGP is uh, compatible with the current BGP, the authenticated passlet can pass along the way while we extending the BGP path. Because, uh, based on this observation, we've proven the lemma that if the consecutive deployment is sufficiently long, that entire pass is secured, even if some of the on-pass ASs are not upgraded. But in reality, how was the you know, actual benefits of this, of, of this FCBGP in partial deployment? And we do some experiment as follows. We sort the AS according to their neighbors of their, uh, according to the numbers of neighbors. And given a deployment rate R, uh, we select the top R ASs to deploy FCBGP. Then for all the BGP updates uh, in, the, uh, in the Keda data set, we check whether the adversary can hijack a BGP update by, uh, by constructing a, a forged uh, but shorter AS pass. And that, then we report this hijack rate for different deployment rates. As we can see from the result, uh, if uh, even give a very low deployment, deployment rate, like 5.5% uh, 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 deployment rate, uh, the FC BGP can reduce the hijack rate uh, from 40% to 20%, which is quite significant. <laughs> Finally, I want to have a single slide for the uh, data play forwarding uh, validation. It's basically uh, by propagating the uh, verifiable routing commitment to the FCPGP, uh, the on-pass ASs can learn the desired pass on the data play. That means uh, in the future, if, the, if this AS has received some traffic that, that violates this, this desired pass, they could enforce some security policies like drop this packet or in, uh, serve them in, in low priority queue. So to conclude, FCBGP is a novel security, uh, novel secure inter-domain routing system uh, that can simultaneously authenticate BGP routing updates and validate data plane forwarding in an efficient and incrementally deployable manner. So FCBGP is built upon a unified primitive named verifiable routing commitment to enhance the security of both the control play and data play forwarding. And FCBGP is fully compatible with BGP and incrementally deployable by offering strictly positive, or, uh, positive security benefits. Uh, for more information, please read our uh, draft. And thank you very much. Hey, Keir Patel, I'm going to um, have one comment as a working group chair and one comment as a working group member. Comment as a working group chair, you should probably consider presenting to Cider Ops group. Um, there is a Cider Ops chair also in this room, so he will make a note of it. Uh, <laughs> working group I, I, chat. I send chair an email. Um, if you present and when you present it in Cider Ops, I bet you will get a uh, very good feedback also as to what happens when the security signatures are, when you get a different kinds of DOS attacks, including the signatures that are being off. How do you sort of decentralize this from a bit of an RIR or registries? And then you did mention a very interesting note here about the performance in terms of scale and convergence time it takes. I have no idea, but I am sure that working group will ask you what kind of CPUs did you run it on, mm -hmm. because the routing router CPUs typically don't equate to the compute CPUs. So are you looking at an offloading schemes or are you trying to do this on the routers? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm next, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> uh, Jeff Ha, so the things, uh, I have to comment on, number one, your procedure in the draft is incomplete. So there's not enough of the information about what goes into the path attribute to know fully how it's supposed to work. It looks like you're just including the calculation. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, so minimally, one of the problems you have is there's no guarantee that the 
device that you receive this from is the one attaching the signature. So that's that's at least one problem that's easy to solve. Yeah. Uh, bigger problem is by comparison, this is a little bit closer to SOBGP in the problem space that it solves, which is fine. No, that was a uh, proposal that worked its way through IETF. Uh, the biggest critique that uh, they had during the BGP sec development experience is that when they were uh, working on this sort of thing, you have to prevent cases of replaying, yes. which I don't believe your mechanism currently does. Uh, and it also uh, does not bind itself to the path. You at least say this is what you're doing. This also means that uh, spoofing is a little bit easier as well. Uh, suppose I to answer this question right now, or we can discuss it, offline. It, it, it feels this is over to, time. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we have maybe another three minutes that we could, uh, we can extend into. But uh, if you have a short answer, that's yeah. great. If not, please, the mailing list would be wonderful. Okay, so short answer for the replay attack. Yeah, it's a problem we are, we are looking right now. We hope to have some timestamp in the FCS to prevent this stuff. And for the entire past security stuff, as we proved through this uh, thing, we think I think it can secure the entire path, even if it only certify a path late. Okay. And, and the lack of uh, pairwise signatures means that uh, you have to rely on the immediate yeah. upstream to be telling you the truth. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. understood. Yeah. Andrew. Hi, um, Andrew here, and speaking as an operator without my AD hat on, and specifically an operator that operates under IP space and the rest allocated by a certain African RIR. Um, I have rather great concerns about the fact that if an RIR were to invalidate rowers, etc., and my understanding is correct, I have put my control of my routing in the hands of five small entities, one of whom currently has no board and no CEO and is being sued and goodness knows what. Um, all I'm going to say is this scares the hell out of me. No answer. Okay, we have time for one brief, no additional one, online or in person. Randy Bush, you have the microphone. Andrew, I believe you're in that condition now. How's it working out for you? Louder, please. Sorry. We are in that condition now with ROV. Yeah. Nobody is complaining of serious breakage. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody complains of a lot of things, Randy, until they happen. And I'd also point out, take a look at the level of routes being signed in Africa at the moment compared to the rest of the world. Ask yourself why to say that just because it hasn't happened yet means that it won't happen and that I must continue to trust. Uh, no, sorry, don't agree. Okay, we are now out of time. Thank you for the presentation and more discussion on the mailing list, uh, both IDR and Cider Ops. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation, BHP extensions for SAV. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nang Gong from Huawei Technology. Uh, today, I, I'd like to introduce the uh, graph about uh, BGP extensions for source address validation networks. Okay, here we focus on root-based source, source, that is, we validate the uh, source address by checking whether the packets with the address coming from the uh, expected uh, uh, interface or directions. Uh, and the uh, cryptology based sub is not our focus. And uh, we focus on intra and interdomain sub. Access sub uh, techniques are not our focus. Uh, here are some existing some mechanisms 
uh, such as SL based uh, filtering as RTBH and a series of URPF mechanisms. Uh, some of them have been implemented in the commercial devices and have been de deployed in real networks, and some are not. Um, here are two uh, working group drafts doing a uh, gap analysis on these mechanisms and uh, points out some limitations. First, uh, ACL and RTBH are not specific for SAW, so some manual configurations are required and uh, high operational overhead may be introduced, especially in dynamic and uh, uh, or complex networks. And the second, URPF do uh, validation based on local routing information. So uh, it can achieve good automation, but uh, under asymmetric routing, the validation may not be accurate. Our observation is that purely rely on uh, local routing information for SAW is not enough to achieve both good automation and uh, high accuracy. To narrow the gaps and uh, according to our observation, we propose BGP subnet is a preliminary idea. Uh, the main idea is to extend the BGP protocols to advertise some specific information between edge border routers of one or multiple ASCs. So what's, it, what's some specific information? Here I show some examples. I will e explain them in the following slides. And uh, with the uh, South Superfrag information, uh, the Azure our border routers can generate uh, uh, accurate South rules automatically at, on the network boundary. Compared to existing some mechanisms, uh, BGP South Net can help routers generate uh, South rules based on not only local routing information, but also sub-specific information. So sub-specific information is uh, complementary to routing information. The sub rules may be more accurate and, uh, and the mechanism can be adaptive to various scenarios. Here is an example for showing BP subnet for protecting internal prefixes. In the figure, we can the uh, deployed AS, router one and the router two are connected to a subnet or a stub customer AS. Router three and the router four uh, are connected to other ASs, that is the internet. With BGP subnet, two things can be done. I mean, BGP subnet first can help border routers to automatically collect uh, internal prefixes from edge routers and uh, these internal prefixes will be blocked uh, at the external interfaces of border routers. That is, the uh, inter, uh, internal source prefix cannot enter the AS from other ASs. And the second thing is it can help edge routers to exchange asymmetrically advertise the routes. And uh, this can help edge routers to construct uh, the complete set of source prefix of a customer networks and uh, the improper block problems can be avoided uh, that may face, be faced by strict URPF. Uh, this uh, BP subnet can support good deployer uh, ability. Uh, I mean, uh, it can work when there are only a part of routers are upgraded. For example, if only router one and router two are upgraded, uh, it can also work because uh, packets coming from the customer AS can be validated. And uh, suppose only router one and router three are upgraded, we can also advertise the internal prefix to the border router, that is router three, and it will help uh, checking uh, the corresponding prefixes. So uh, it can be deployed uh, incrementally. And uh, it also supports good convergence. So, so specific information can be propagated uh, with a similar speed as uh, uh, routing information. And the second, the convergence of BGP subnet is uh, simpler than, than the routing uh, because the router can do the, um, 
uh, can generate the rules with, without the complete information. And uh, it doesn't need to wait for the convergence of other routers. Uh, this is another example to show BGP subnet for protecting remote prefixes. In the figure, we have uh, two AS deployed. AS1 is the source AS, that is, uh, his, his uh, prefix uh, needs to be protected. And AS4 is a validation AS. Uh, AS4 will check the validity of uh, source prefixes of AS1. Uh, in the under BP subnet, source AS as one can notify the target source prefixes, prefixes and uh, the expected incoming directions of these uh, prefixes. Uh, these uh, uh, prefixes can uh, maybe the uh, important uh, addresses, and uh, these incoming directions can be um, automatically collected from the rib or can be configured manually or some other methods. And the validation S can check the incoming directions. And uh, here are three uh, possible use cases. First, uh, the validation S can pro provide the service like uh, proactive source address validation for the uh, source S. And, and the second, uh, it, the service can be reactive source address filtering for mitigating DDoS attacks suffered by the source S. And the third, uh, uh, to uh, protect the forwarding paths, uh, we can, uh, uh, the source S can choose a preferred predefined path and the validation S to check whether the forwarding path is the uh, uh, chosen path uh, by the source AS. Here are some uh, design considerations. Uh, we show why we choose the routing protocols and uh, we extend the BGP for advertising uh, specific information with the in and the between ASs. Because we mo mainly focus on doing validation on the network boundary for protecting both internal and uh, remote prefixes. So we plan to use, use one protocol to adapt, to adapt to various scenarios and uh, simplify the design workload. And uh, we can also use existing basic designs, and uh, it can also provide a good uh, service isolation. And we also, uh, our prelim preliminary idea is to define new surface to provide a good uh, isolation. Okay, next uh, we'll make the design complete, and the comments are welcome. David, you're first. Uh, David Lampader. The draft currently says in security considerations that it doesn't introduce any security considerations. Um, I very much disagree, especially as soon as you're looking at any eBGP use case. Um, there needs to be a lot more text and figuring out how exactly this is going to work. On slide six, you had at the left like ROV something. I'm not sure what exactly you're intending to do there. This really needs a, a lot more work. Um, yeah, thanks. Yes, R security is really a big problem, especially in the interdomain. Yeah. Um, well, I would go as far as say, un unless this is reasonably clear, I I'm not sure how to move forward with this. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly I'm supposed to do here as an implementer security wise. Uh, in the example, uh, a brief, brief explanation. Uh, in the in the example, uh, the source address, uh, source AS, uh, establish connections uh, with the validation AS directly, so the information can be protected by TLS. Hey, uh, I, global. Uh, I don't understand how you could validate prefixes when they are not routed. I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you accept the prefixes, but you accept internal prefixes that are not routed, or they do, they, where do you do the validation of the extra prefixes that you don't get when you are doing uh, normal source address validation? Yeah, the validation is done as AS4 in the example, and uh, for which the focused uh, source prefix 
are advertised by AS1. So, so how do you validate that they are allowed to come from AS1? Mm. AS1 also deploy BP subnet, so they can get connections, and uh, uh, it depends on the chosen or config configurations of AS1. Yes, but if AS1 is not allowed to propagate them, uh, AS1 can propagate its information to AS4. Uh, that, that depends on who. That, that depends on RPKI as well, right? So if he is not allowed to originate a prefix, but he's uh, doing yeah, it yeah, anyway. So we, we, so we, we need a raw enabled at S4. Yeah, S1 cannot announce uh, render more prefix. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah, so I understand. I, yeah. th I think the validation needs some more explanation. Right, right, validation is necessary. Okay, Kevur Patel, um, I have one comment as working group chair and then one comment as a working group member. With my chair hat on, you're going to do most of this work in SAV working group, right? SAV, SAVnet. Oh, SAVnet, yeah. yeah. We, we'll have another. Yeah, we're we'll happy to take a look at it when you have BGP extensions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm assuming most of the work is done, comment for chairs, we'll have to coordinate with the SAVnet working group chairs. Uh, working group chair head off, one comment as a working group member. Um, you probably also want to consider more complex cases because most of the times when you are doing a forwarding validation, there are features like fast convergence enabled over and above what you announce, what you don't announce. How do you do the prefix validation, link protection, stuff like that. So having some more text beefed up inside here over and above would be helpful. Okay. Thank we'll you. About it carefully. Thank you. Thank you. We're out of time, so I'll take my question to the queue. Antoine, do not jump the queue next time. Go for it. Especially before your chair. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Jesse, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jesse Wang from Tsinghua University. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about BGP community-based attacks. And we are going to propose to extend BGP to support community orange authentication to solve the security problem. Uh, next, I, I guess, I, I can't. Thank you. Um, we know that in RFC 1997, BGP community is defined as a group of destinations which share some common properties. In practice, BGP community is an optional transitive BGP attribute used to tag metadata in routing announcements. So it provides the ability to signal opaque information to aid in routing management. According to some measurement study, its usage in the internet has continued to increase during the past decade. IFC 8195 uh, summarized uh, that there are two types of uh, BGP communities. One is informational community, which is used to label the routes that have uh, uh, particular properties. The other is the action community, which is used to notify upstream AS to conduct some actions. Next, thank you. Next. Uh, for action communities, the values and the semantics of community must be negotiated between the two AS. Uh, that is, one AS defines a BGP community value uh, we can name it as a uh, BGP community definer. It can be viewed as the definer is providing a service. And then other AS can tag the value on some routes to request the service from the definer. We call them community taggers, and in fact, they are service requester. Next. Currently, any AS on the forwarding parts can add any community values to a routing announcement. The recipient of a, a, a routing announcement with a community value cannot determine which AS on the parts added any of the community values. 
So uh, a statement in IFC 79.99, I guess we, uh, are, we, we are very familiar with it. HV contains no specific uh, mechanism to prevent uh, the uh, also authorized uh, modification of information by the forwarding agent. Therefore, BGP community values may be used to influence the routing system in unintended ways. Next. Uh, so here is an example. Consider a prefix in AS1. Um, AS3 has two candidate parses to, uh, to, to this prefix. It received two parses. The first one, the left, the left one is received from a, a peer, which is AS2, and the second is from AS4, which is a provider of AS3. So in general, AS3 would like to select the left parse, which is a peer route, because this route is preferred to a provider route. I suppose AS4 is, a, is an attacker who would like to change AS3's routing decision and attract the traffic flow to the right parse because it can get revenue from this traffic flow. Uh, AS4 noticed that AS3 is providing a community-based service of tuning local preference. It means AS3 agrees to tuning, a local, tuning the local preference of a route based on the instruction of community values. So AS4 can send a routing announcement with the community value CSX90. Uh, after receiving this routing announcement, AS3 would set the local preference of this route to backup customer route. It's a higher priority than a peering route. So in the best route selection phase, AS3 would, would like to select the right parse as its best parse. Then AS3 suffers financial loss since it needs to pay AS4. Um, from this example, we can see that it's necessary for AS3 to check whether AS4 is allowed to use these community values. But now in the current internet, there is no way for AS3 to know the identity of the community taggers. So this kind of community-based attacks cannot prevent it. Uh, next. So we propose our next. So, so it's, uh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Let's look at the community-based attacks in the wild. Um, it's difficult, if not infeasible, to de detect the community-based attacks since business agreements are always private and whether a service is allowed to be used is a part of private business agreements. We noticed that there is one reported case in July uh, 2018 in which BGP community-based attacks were used to increase the propagation of hijacked routes. Uh, besides the reported case, there is a research effort to try to explore the effectiveness of communication-based attacks in the internet. The experiment shows that among 207 community values, 25 community values successfully black hold the traffic from at least one wanted point, which means the attacks using them are successful. Since this kind of uh, attacks do not modify AS parse attribute, so RPKR and BGPSEC cannot prevent them. Next. So we propose our uh, solution. Next. Uh, we, are, we, we, we propose to add a new BGP attribute, namely SEC community. The solution is based on RPKI certificates. For community tagger, it must have a RPKI certificate to generate a digital signature to make sure its identity is authentic and knowable to the recipient. For community definer, which is the root recipient and the one to take action, it needs to define a community access control list according to the business agreements to specify which AS are granted or denied access to a particular action community value it defines. 
So after receiving a routing announcement with a community value, it needs to verify the digital signature to know the identity of the community tagger and then check whether the community tagger is allowed to add this community value by consulting its pre-configured control list. If permitted, then conduct the action and remove the community value from the route. Next. So uh, this is the format of our proposed BGP attribute. We just skip the details. And next. Our solution can be incrementally deployed in the internet. It does not need all the AIs on the path to do signature or validations. It only needs to be signed by the AIs who use this action community service and verified by the AIs who provides the service to get the security benefit. Other AIs can just ignore the new attribute. Uh, yeah, now we need to we need to register a new attribute. And next page. We would like to provide more information on BGP community in other RFCs. In fact, uh, restricting the usage of BGP community has been suggested uh, in two RFCs, uh, but they only focus on one type uh, of BGP community, uh, which is black holing. And they require that community values should only convey information between two directly neighboring AIs. However, measurements shows that almost 30% uh, of the black holding community values traveled more than one hop, which shows that the recommendation of these two RFCs are not respected in current internet. Uh, more importantly, the restriction of one hop significantly reduces the value of BGP communities and we believe BGP community values must be able to support the community, uh, the communication between two remote AS. Next page. So the next step, uh, this is our first time to propose uh, to present this proposal in IETF. So comments and discussions are highly appreciated. We are happy to take any comments and discussion via emails or on the IDR list. We will keep improving the draft and we'll try to attend IETF 119 in person in the next year. If the feedback is positive, we will go to implementations. That's all for my presentation. Questions? Thank you, Jesse. Uh, this is Jeff Haas. Uh, three very quick comments. We are running slightly over time, so we'll keep this very short. Uh, comment number one, uh, this minimally should get review in the CIDR Ops Working Group. We'll figure out uh, where this work does belong at some point. The second comment is that the uh, cryptography that's involved here is going to require potentially a large number of skis available on the device, potentially even higher than that for PGP sec. So that is a potentially a uh, deployment consideration that is challenging. Uh, the third item is that your community format is sort of abstract and doesn't quite line up with uh, what's out there. So let's work on your encodings a little bit uh, on the mailing list. And we have uh, comments from David uh, as well. Uh, David Lampotter, um, you only have one example that you cite about community values being used to attack something in the uh, global routing domain. In that particular example, um, the community values were completely ancillary to the attack, i.e. it was a plain old route hijack. Um, it would be very useful and relevant if you have a, an example where the community values itself are the actual attack, because otherwise this is simply not necessary. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I will uh, contact uh, uh, Side Ops Chair later uh, to discuss the issue, uh, and I will send my uh, feedback on the IDR list. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Our next presentation is on maintaining consistency of vendor domain routing and forwarding. Uh, he hello. 
Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, hello everyone. I'm Sheng Nanyue from China Mobile. We propose a new draft uh, maintain consistency of inter-domain routing and forwarding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, AS pass attribute of BGP update records the AS number that it has passed through. Ideally, the traffic to the destination IP prefixes should be reversely forwarded along the pa AS pass recorded in the AS pass attribute. However, the complete forwarding AS pass is determined by both BGP protocol and non BGP factors. The actual forwarding AS pass is usually different with the AS pass in BGP update. For example, AS1 selects BGP routes from AS4. The expected AS pass is AS2 and AS4. However, AS2 redirects traffic from AS4 to AS3. The origin AS may be any AS does not see the actual forwarding AS pass from the BGP announcement. This could lead to some security risks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the inconsistency between the expected AS pass and the the actual AS pass lead to the following risk. A traffic black hole. There is no corresponding route for the next hop AS, resulting in a black hole. For example, an AS redirects traffic from provider AS to another uh, customer AS, which also violates the value free principle. A loop. The forwarding AS pass that has not been checked by BGP may lead to rules. For example, the AS pass before redirection and after redirection may contain the same AS, which is a risk that cannot be circumvented by the current BGP protocol. Detour, the complete forwarding AS pass is composed of multiple AS paths from different protocol, which may lead to unnecessary lessening of AS path. Uh, malicious AS, the actual AS pass is not visible to the origin AS, which may cause its packet to pass through some AS it does not expect it. Uh, Non-optimal route, the AS may prefer some uh, AS that not be included in the actual pass to select a non-optimal route. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so what results in the inconsistency? The first reason is inter-domain traffic re redirection. Due to load balancing, IT DOS, etc., uh, policy-based routing or BGP flows by may be configured to redirect traffic to a new next hop AS which is different with the next hope AS determined by AS pass attribute in BGP update. Uh, next. Um, the operators may utilize other protocols such as MPLS or SR to steer traffic to the specified AS path, which is different from the AS pass in BGP update. The complete forwarding AS path is determined by BGP and the T protocols. The path is actually transparent to the orange AS and is not verified by its filters. Uh, next. Um, to minimize routing tables, routing aggregation is widely used in IP networks. After root aggregation, the ordered AS sequence is converted to the unordered AS site. However, AS site does not represent the AS forwarding path of the data packet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how to maintain consistency of interdomain routing and forwarding? Uh, our initial idea is to get the complete forwarding as passed by BGP. There are two steps. Uh, first, to obtain deviation as pass and then advertise the deviation path. Uh, next. Uh, to obtain deviation as pass, 
We first acquired the next hope as and the destination prefix of the uh, re redirection rule. Then we look up the S path in H rib Z from the uh, next hop AS according to the destination prefix. The AS that generates the deviation AS path is obliged to check it. If the uh, valid free principle is not satisfied, the redirection rule is valid and uh, should not be configured by the operator. It is uh, recommended to uh, utilize this method to violate redirection rules. Only redi uh, redirection rules that are violated as legal can be used to direct uh, uh, traffic forwarding. Uh, next. Um, and uh, advertising the deviation path, uh, the AS that generates the deviation path is obliged to check and advertise it to other AS. The deviation AS path and attributes of the specific flow should uh, be included in BGP update as shown in the figure. As for advertise a BGP update to ASX uh, along the S path AS1 to 4. And AS2 is a redirection AS which uh, redirects the packet routing from S4 to S3. As a result, uh, the actual forwarding path of packets from AS1 to S4 is AS1, AS2, AS3, AS, and AS4. So AS2 should add a D path to BGP update. The D path uh, refers the actual forwarding S path through which the uh, packet sent to S4. The AS2 that generates the deviation path is obliged to advertise it to other AS. Uh, the orange AS then uh, combines the path to get the complete forwarding S path. The path is very Find to be optimal or secure using the local S path filter. And the path that passes through malicious AS will not be selected by the orange AS. And next, uh, so if uh, inter domain routing and forwarding keep consistent, uh, T and the root security will be significantly uh, simplified. Moreover, the ability of the orange AS to play its own forwarding S path opens the black box of the internet. Um, pro problems that have applied the, the internet for decades, such as visualization and troubleshooting, uh, may be solved. Next. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so any questions or comments are welcome. And then we will uh, refine the solution in the future. So thank you. Okay, Chair Patel. Um, again, one comment as working group chair, please also run it by Cider Ops. They, you will get a lot more feedback there, I suggest. And taking the working group chair head off. The other comment is that um, you. I suggest you do some pros and cons and run your comparison against BGPSEC and other forward signing mechanisms to say how this is better than that uh, compared to BGPSEC and ASPA. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you for your presentation. Okay, this, this is going to be a bit shorter than intended for the 20 minutes, we had some meeting with implementers, so uh, you may get some time back. Okay, there's a history. Uh, we had uh, full spec V1, its focus was DDoS, uh, and um, our goal in going to flow spec V2 was not to make uh, too many changes, but to provide stepwise uh, progression, but there were errors in flow spec V1, in case you missed it, uh, that uh, it didn't have a TLV format. Okay, so flow spec V2 was adopted by the working group with uh, matches that had user ordering and used that TLV format. 
It also has uh, inherited the actions from the extended community and uh, planned to put in a community container in wide, uh, in the draft that's called wide communities draft, which describes a container and then a specific implementation of that container as a wide community. Okay, wide communities was returned to the working group. It's good to take a look. So we looked at splitting it because IDR has a strong uh, viewpoint that you will have two implementations and feedback from implementers was it was too much to do and they had the highest priority of the TLV format and actions only on uh, extended communities. So maybe we'll chunk off that part. Um, there are questions that need to even be looked at in that. What happens if the action fails? I met with some implementers, okay? And then, oh, excuse me, in this, this is my individual contributor hat and not my chair hat. The other chairs will judge if the work is uh, valid. Okay, so, we have a lot of questions for implementers. And so this is a call. If you're using FlowSpec and you want, you're an operator and you use it, and you want something specific, we design stuff. And what I'm getting back from the few implementers uh, is more thoughts and viewpoint. Uh, in this uh, place, we put in user order and then a type where the type is somewhat of an application, IP traffic or L2 VPN, and then a bunch of components, lists of components under a particular order. So sometimes that works well and is efficient, and in some implementations it's not. There are two implementations. There is the implementation of DDoS, and then there is the implementation of directed flow uh, spec rules. So all of this is, please, if you're an implementer, if your company's got it, contact me so we can try to find out what's the minimal set and we'll keep the base working group document as the uh, collection of all, but we're trying to cut off uh, little pieces so we can get this out in the internet. Questions? Feedback. I wanted to give this introduction before you heard the flow spec uh, uh, presentations uh, so you knew where we were with flow spec V2. Short questions. Nothing on that. No comments. Great. Thank you, Sue. We got time back. Next presentations on BHP flow spec for traffic and press action. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Shimin from Huawei. I will present a new BGP flow spec traffic field action called uh, traffic compress. Next slide, please. Uh, why we require compressed network transmission data? First, uh, prior. Private lines have high cost. Some enterprise expected expect to compress traffic before transmitting it on the network. Second, the network bandwidth resources are limited. The debt vo volume on the network increases rapidly, but the network investment growth is limited. Compressing is an effective technology to save network resource. Next slide, please. Why is the field action for compression, compressed traffic required? First, the receiver needs to notify the sender of which, which packet needs to be compressed and when to start data compression. Second, if the decompression capability of the receive end is fault, the, the, send, the sending end needs to be notified to stop compressing data. Three, the compressing algorithm decoded by the receiver and the sending, sending end needs to be matched. Four, 
periodically change the algorithm or optimize the algorithm is required. To sum up, using flow spec matching rules and uh, traffic press action uh, to, trans to transmit compression information between the receive end and the sending end is a very eff effective method. Next, please. <coughs> Traffic, traffic compress can be used in the following uh, scenarios. Uh, for DC, uh, periodic dead backup or transmission between data centers. Uh, for enterprise, uh, remote transmission of enterprise service data, such as database and video or audio. Uh, where uh, next, please. We recommend uh, use, using extended community to represent a traffic compressed action. Um, first, uh, it, it has a gener generic, generic tra transistive extended community type uh, 80. The the subtype indicate indicated the flow spec uh, traffic compressed action, and uh, two two byte two byte uh, global administrator filter encoded uh, compression algorithm type, and the four four byte uh, local administrator filter is reserved for future use and must be set to zero. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. OK, this is Jeff Haas. Uh, my comment on this are two. First one is uh, this feature does not require flow spec version 2 because it is only being signaled by the addition of a new extended community. And the second point is that uh, since it is only an extended community, once you believe that your document has reached no stability, it is OK to ask for early allocation or first come, first serve for this so you can advance your document sooner. So this means that you can move this document fast if you want to. OK. Are there any questions online or in the room? There are no further questions. Thank you for your presentation. Our final presentation for the day is BHP Flow Spec Extensions for Path Scheduling. Uh, good afternoon. There, uh, this is my second uh, presentation. I think it will not take too much time. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a BEP flow spike extension for part scheduling. And uh, for the background, it's uh, quite similar to the, the previous presentation for the, because in the TED network, uh, we may shut down some links or nodes to reduce the energy consumption, but uh, it leads to the topology changes. Uh, however, we can take the uh, advantage of uh, pre uh, predictability of changes and uh, steer traffic to the new paths in advance to prevent the park loss. Uh, as we know, flow spec provides a method for us to steer traffic, uh, steer traffic into a specific path uh, based on the traffic features. So we can do that uh, by flow spec. Okay, uh, this page shows what we intention to flow spec. We define a new component of uh, matching rules. Uh, it is uh, concluded for uh, one. Uh, one byte uh, type and one byte length and a variable shedding time information. 
And uh, we also define the two formats of scheduling time information for the periodic and uh, periodic uh, uh, scenarios. And uh, the formats is quite similar to the previous uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, this page shows the procedures. Uh, firstly, the controller or uh, node need to create a flow spec and uh, the uh, other world has it to the head end. And when the head end receives the flow spec with the scheduling time information, it will uh, store the time uh, information. And uh, when, I, when a package arrives, it will if the package arriving time matches the uh, scheduling time of this uh, flow spec, and then it will steer this packet to its uh, uh, specific uh, tunnels, uh, VPNs, uh, or uh, policies. And uh, that's all. Uh, any comments or opinions? Welcome. Any questions online or in the room? I think this is very straightforward compared to last time. Many of the same comments okay. still apply. So yeah. look for more discussion on the mailing list. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We have uh, finished a little bit early after reclaiming some time. If there's any generic discussion that you want to kick off based on prior presentations or maybe gripes you have from stuff discussed on the mailing list, you know, now is an excellent time to spend a few minutes on that. And this includes people that are working remote. And since we mostly are seeing people running for the door, I think uh, we will declare success. IDR will have another session on Friday, and we will see you then. Oh, actually, we have uh, Greg on the queue. Greg, feel free to speak up. OK, I guess Greg has nothing to say. See you on Friday. Uh, so I'm I, not going to go there. I can do 8 o'clock breakfast, but I have a 9.30 session. I don't need to. <laughs>